My granddaughter recently asked me, why is sugar bad for you? Actually, it was her dad ducking the question by sending her to me after he told her she couldn't have soda pop. How to explain to a four-year-old the impact food has on health? I'm not sure what my answer was, but I don't think I convinced her. Still, it brings that question forth. Is sugar bad for you? Through the years, sugary foods have been blamed for many health problems, from obesity and cancer to hyperactivity and depression. Yet research supporting those conclusions is not as clear as is often assumed. I'm not going to be able to settle those debates, but we can take a look at our basic understanding of what happens to carbohydrates in the body and better understand how different foods impact blood sugar. Let's take a quick review at blood glucose regulation. So if you recall, when we take a look at blood glucose regulation, we will bring someone in fasting and we're going to give them food. Usually their blood glucose in fasting will be below 100 milligrams per deciliter. We give them food, their blood glucose will rise. Insulin is released in response to that from the pancreas and insulin will signal tissues to take glucose out of the blood into the cell. That gives a, a blood glucose response curve that looks like this, rising and then bringing back down. When you have a blood glucose response that is higher or longer, it's going to take more insulin to actually get that back down to a normal blood glucose. That can be problematic, especially for those individuals who are struggling to regulate blood glucose, for example, people with diabetes. It would be helpful if we could compare foods to see how the body responds, and there's been a system developed and just to do for that purpose. That system is called the glycemic index. The glycemic index compares foods to a set standard. Now I'm using the term standard here loosely. It's not a standard for a perfect response or the most healthful response. Rather, it's a comparison to the most basic form of carbohydrates, either starch or glucose. And so here's how they're going to do that. First of all, they're going to bring people into a research environment and they're going to give them glucose and typically, or starch, but we'll use glucose in this example. Typically, they're going to give them 50 grams worth of that, that food. Bring them in fasting, we'll be, have a normal blood glucose, and then we'll have a blood glucose response curve, curve that we see and we'll take the blood glucose about every half hour and we'll get this response curve. Now, through the wonders of calculus, we can now measure that area under the curve. And whatever that value is, we're just going to artificially put it to the value of 100. So it's not a unit. We have no units, not milligrams per deciliter. It's not a blood sugar. It's just 100. That's what we're going to say is our standard. It's glucose. Now let's bring those people back in again, or maybe we'll bring in a different group of people. We're going to do this with all kinds of people and all types of foods, but this time we're just going to give them one specific food. We're going to give them beans. We're still going to give them 50 grams of carbohydrates, not the weight of the food, but the actual amount of carbohydrates. We bring them in fasting, look at the normal blood glucose, and watch that blood glucose response. Once again, we're going to measure that area under the curve. And in this instance, it's lower, it's a lower value, and we could do a comparative value, maybe we'll say that's 40. Now do that over and over and over again with all kinds of people and all kinds of foods. We can get a sense of how the body responds to those different foods. Below here, I have a short list of foods that are considered high, medium, and low glycemic index foods. So here are high glycemic index foods, and they would have a GI of glycemic index of greater than 70, medium of a GI of 55 to 69, and low glycemic index have a glycemic index of less than 55. So potatoes, rice, bagels, instant oatmeal are considered high glycemic index, and watermelon there too. Medium, french fries, popcorn, this is whole oats, and then here's soda pop. Low glycemic index foods would be carrots, beans, bananas, ice cream, milk, here's chocolate, uh, orange juice and other lentils. Now this is a really interesting aspect to understand how foods respond in our body, but it can be confusing and hard to use. So we can talk about the positive and negatives of the glycemic index. One negative is that it's hard to see. We've listed here and shown here some foods in these different categories, and you can't just by looking at a food tell where it's going to land. In particular, you can't tell by sweetness. Here are sweet foods. 
here's ice cream and chocolate, but it has a low glycemic index. And we look at potatoes, rice, and bagels, which are not sweet at all, and it has a high glycemic index. So that makes it very difficult to use. Another thing is that people will confuse this with calories. They'll assume something that has a high glycemic index has more calories, but that's not the case at all. Off carbohydrates have four calories per gram. If something has a higher glycemic index, it may take longer to get those uh, glucose into the cell or into the blood, but it's going to get all those calories there. So it's not linked with calories. Another problem with the glycemic index is all that research is done with one food at a time. If you take that potato and you put some chicken and cheese on it, it's going to change the glycemic index when you eat it. But the research was done with one food at a time, not how we eat food. So those are some of the problems with trying to use and implement the glycemic index. Still, it has a positive use for it. It's physiologically significant. When an individual is struggling to maintain blood glucose, when they eat more low glycemic index foods, it does lead to a, a reduced need for insulin. So that's a positive health outcome. So glycemic index is a great tool to compare one food to the next with respect to how the body will respond. It has its negatives, not easy to see, it's hard, uh, not related to calories, even though people sometimes think it, it is. Um, but the positive are it makes a difference. And if this is something you need to control your blood glucose, you can learn the G glycemic index for your most commonly consumed foods. And there are glycemic index um, values all over the web. You can use your smartphone to look it up if you're eating a new food. So here's a tool that we can use not to know whether sugar is going to cause uh, health problems, but we can at least look to see how the body responds to different types of foods.